Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live from this year's 2019 New York City Winter Jazz Festival. As always here on the Pace Report during the Winter Jazz Festival, I like to always interview as well as profile an artist that's getting ready to make a dent here and abroad. Vocalist Haley Tuck hails from Austin, Texas, and she was influenced by actress and dancer Louise Brooks. Now, her debut record on Sony entitled Junk is a hybrid of songs that she's written as well as many, many covers ranging from the great Leonard Cohen to the great Bob Dylan, just to name the endless few. And what she's done is she's taking and reaching out into music of this generation instead of going reaching back into the songs of Tin Pan Alley and the Great American Songbook. Now what's made her very unique is that she started her career overseas performing and recording EPs that were very, very critically acclaimed in the UK as well as parts of Europe. Tonight I had a chance to sit down and break bread with her briefly to talk about her origins growing up in Austin, Texas, how she decided to find her voice overseas, and what she expects of her music fans here on American soil. Tonight's performance is taken live at Public Arts here in New York City as part of this year's 2019 New York City Winter Jazz Festival. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of Ms. Haley Tuck as part of the Pace Report here in New York City. Congratulations. This is the very first time New Yorkers are hearing the brand new music from Jump. Yes, I'm so excited. I've, you know, it's funny because New York is like the center, obviously, of like 
you know, jazz and all of your, all of your dreams. But because my career is in is in Europe, even though I am, in fact, a, a Southern belle. Well, maybe I probably would have gotten kicked out of Cotillion, but at least somewhat close to a Southern belle. Um, I have been desperate to come back and be able to play in New York. So this is the first show, and I'm going to do some more in spring and autumn. Now we're gonna we're gonna get into your career because you have a serious following in Europe and now you're in the beginning phases of starting your career here. Now this record was produced by the great Larry Klein and this man has had a plethora of successful runs with great female vocalists. I mean, I, 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 I kind of, it's kind of a joke, but kind of, it's a joke, not joke, that I, when I text him, I something like, I call him my guru, because he also, he, one, he's so much more hands-on and personally involved than, than, besides basically my manager and my, my mother, nobody cares more about what I'm doing in my life than Larry. He, he'll watch all my videos and give me critiques, even, like parents do and stuff, which are all constructive, and he, he's taught me so much, and I basically, it's crazy, I just, I, I, even when, when on, on the album, we did one song that was, because he was married to Joni Mitchell, and he wanted me to do a Joni Mitchell song, and I was like, not doing a Joni Mitchell song in front of you, buddy, like, this is a terrible idea, and he said, actually, he said, I think you're a storyteller, and that's what you need to realize about yourself, is that, and I was like, oh, you mean I talk all the time, yes. But he's like, you're a storyteller, and that's where you need to go with your music. And and tr try to. F and the other thing he said, which was my other like, you know, mantra, was um, to not do curios because he was like, you some of these songs you're you're picking because you just want to sing them and you want to do like yourself as egotistical karaoke. Or even when I was when we were writing together, he was saying, you can't just like try to fit some weird concept into like this sentence just because you want it in there and want people somebody out there might like know this book or something and you think you'll sound great that's a curio something that'll just pass that'll be cool for a second and you'll be done with it and then five years from now you might regret doing it um so yeah i mean to be honest i i, I i'm so lucky 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 tucky ducky to have worked with him and i'm excited for it. now it's album two i'm meeting with him next week so now that the, the plans begin. And I'll do so many things different. I was so nervous, like like Jay Bellarose is on drums. Um, and and basically all of these people that I just completely worshipped were, were playing in a room. And they would say things like when we were re recording, we were recording at Sunset Sound, all of this is just basically a complete dream come true for me, like beyond dream come true, like way beyond even what my dream was. And like they'd be like, what do you think of that? And I was like, good. Sounds, sounds great, David. Thank you very much. So, yeah. You know, the thing that I really admire about what you have done and have, have accomplished, and I've been saying this because I cover jazz, but I also cover a little bit of R&B and hip-hop, too. The problem with jazz today, and this is just my opinion, we have to start interpreting music of our generation. There's only so much How David and Burt Bacharach we can sing. Right. There's, so, there's only so much Rodgers and Hammerstein. And I, come on, we mm -hmm. need to put the American Songbook to a rest. You just come out and start doing everything. You do Dylan, you do Leonard Cohen. I mean, Tina Turner. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that, and I think that's kind of courageous at your age because you're 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 young. I just think that that just takes a lot of courage for you to do something like that. Well, I mean, thank you for saying that. I feel like it's less courage and more like by necessity. I mean, the second thing I listen to, with more like just as much as jazz, is hip hop, and obviously, like, there's not ever in my future going to be any sort of like like Haley Tuck you know freestyles don't worry but I do I that's kind of what started getting me thinking of it when I was when I was doing 
like, because of course my first couple albums, you want to do exactly like the great, you want to do these like beautiful ballads that you have heard somebody else do that have inspired you, that Billie Holiday has done, and you want to do it, you know, not, of course, not as good, but as you want to somehow inject, you know, that whole experience that you had in with it. Whereas I feel like once I started actually thinking about it, I was thinking, this is insane. What do I put on every single day? You know, I uh, I put on, like, I put on Wu-Tang Clan mostly every morning. You know, like, I, this is, and that doesn't mean that I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, there as far as like <laughs> there's not any Wu-Tang Clan like jazz covers that I want to do because I think sometimes that can get like cheesy and kitsch and like it's such a fine line you know right. of, like covering like I want to do a Maroon 5 cover I want to do a Leonard Cohen cover but I don't know you know like there's such a fine line before then it's just kind of annoying that you're just doing like a jazz cover or something great that maybe didn't need to need to be done necessarily um but I'm I mean I'm glad you like it I'm I I know it's it, it can be controversial. I actually had like a close friend of mine that I'd known forever and worked with musically. He's like, well, you're not doing jazz anymore. You're not really a jazz artist. And I was like, wow, I feel like I am a jazz artist still. Um, I just don't think that, I don't think, you know, like, you know, on We Get Requests, do you know that, do you know that with Ed, Ed, with Ed and, Peterson. yeah, and Oscar Peterson uh, and Ray Brown, I think, on bass. And they're doing music of the cur- of of the current time then like they were I, they'd are also kind of already gone gone through the book i'm not saying that i'm prolific enough i mean i'm with you on like sometimes it can be at large put to bed and maybe it's nice to start looking forward a little bit and seeing yeah i mean it's a little bit more contemporary i mean 80s is not you know 60s 70s 80s 90s now is not really completely contemporary but <laughs> Texas Mm -hmm. and Austin is a very progressive city musically Uh, how do we get from Austin Texas to boarding school to overseas because your 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 journey is very interesting 
Um, well, boarding school, my dad totally ran the one of the best scams of all time on me. He had gone to this Baptist military, Baptist military boarding school when he was a kid. And um, he told me, I was into Harry Potter at the time, and he said, you know, like, when Harry Potter goes to boarding school, like Hogwarts? And I was like, yeah, he's like, that's what... That's what SMA is like. It's just like Hogwarts. And instead of Hogwarts, it's Baptist Military Boarding School. Not like Hogwarts. That was, I, I want my money back on that one. <laughs> but I went there, and I think, in the end, I think it was probably, it was, it was, it was good. I mean, I certainly probably needed a little military in my life. But I, I guess because of, like, the kind of close-knit, Thing, you know that like Baptist and it's very like going to Halley sort of I it opened my mind up to f even further possibilities rather than like dreaming of going to Austin I was dreaming of like escaping you know and because mil you know military school you want to dream big you know you want to get like very far away from from marching at 5 a.m. and um, and I was reading all these books about Paris and um, I had been in this burn accident actually and of course because uh, it's America, like my dad sued. And long story short, I had this money from the burn accident. And it was supposed to be for college. Um, and basically the second, but like some idiot made it mine at 18. Never give an 18 year old like access to a bank account. And I moved to Paris and I found, like it's interesting like you're saying like, you're right, because all of my career, even though it's so strange because I'm, I'm, a hundred percent obviously like you know American from Texas whatever the whole the whole gamut but I have my whole career has been in Europe and I think part of the reason I stayed there besides the fun besides you know a million other things along the way and choices is that there's been a great huge support for music in in Europe that I have found sometimes I've struggled with a bit in 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 America like I, of course I like I always work with a local band and everything, but some of the like some of the fees. I mean, I even when I, I recorded an EP with Eric Harland, and you know, I I actually he gave me huge like friend rates on it, but you know I paid him whatever for session work, and then he was going and playing I think at Birdland for not a lot of money I don't know he told me how much but I was just I was shocked basically and I was like wow I wish I could have gotten you for that price I wish I had Birdland prices on on Harland and while recording even though he was completely generous and gave me like a really really great feat but um I, I guess I just mean I think it's amazing to me that sometimes in and, and that's not that that's probably not everybody's experience I'm sure there's a lot of people who are like I'm gl I want people to get paid, I want people to make a living, but my experience here has been difficult so far, kind of, to break in as easily as I, I felt like the support I had in Europe. And it's nice, though, with this album, now I have something a bit more like, a bit more meat under my belt regarding the European thing, because before, when I was trying to balance both of them, it just didn't work, you know, when I was trying to, like, so I kind of had to just pick one. And now, though, it's it's such a different world and so amazing and there's su such different types of musicians here it's not even better or, or you know or whatever it's just there's there's kind of a feel of new york musicians that that i think is really amazing and i don't know i've i really this is i hope this year i'm going to do obviously hopefully do more shows here but i'm interested to see kind of i guess where it goes and and i'd love to hear more about other people's experiences here and because there's got to be tips just like in europe i could give tips you know there has to be there's there's different ways to play each game like in, in each place i think what do you I, think I, I think so i mean america this is where we, we where some of the best jazz or you're right some of the best musicians i mean la musicians play totally different than new orleans musicians mm -hmm. Philly musicians play totally different than Detroit musicians. Mm -hmm. There's a very unique spirit in these cities. And some of it is by way of some of their background, whether it be Caribbean, whether it be Creole, whether mm -hmm. it be, I mean, they have some very unique backgrounds. And this is what makes America such a great melting pot because everybody from all, one thing that everybody f finds out when they come to New York, 
everybody's from somewhere else. Right. And that's what makes this this city tick. Mm -hmm. And I think with you going over to Europe, they're digging the whole American vernacular of the songs that you're singing. Right. You're tapping into something that they dug from afar and right. you're they're close up to it. Sometimes they put Texas on on like festival things, you know, instead of like USA. Mm -hmm. It the like in in there's it's it's interesting even like in the in Eastern Europe there was a huge you know D the show Dallas. Mm -hmm. Dallas became this entire like when the fall of communism was coming. Don't worry, we won't go too far into this, but that Dallas became this crazy TV show because they'd never seen anything like that like before, and it was being pirated basically, and so it's crazy because now I have kind of this career in Eastern Europe that's in that a lot of times involves people like a lot of like like older women especially coming up and saying like you're from Texas like right do you do you know the TV show Dallas and I'm like yeah I know the TV show Dallas <laughs> this is great like I can't believe we're having political conversations about the TV show Dallas because it was shown as like this thing that was supposed to be the excesses of the West. And I think that that, it makes it interesting, and you're right, it does make it for a slightly different infrastructure for touring, because that's, that's an, not an angle, but that's something that is involved with sometimes, because you never know like where, like where it sticks. But in, I, in America, I can imagine it's difficult, because it seems like kind of like the, the like nobody's, nobody's flying you, people, people will very easily fly you from London to Italy to do a show. Easy. But it's very difficult to be flown from New York to Chicago, have your whole band put up in a hotel, you know, go out to dinner. Everybody still makes money at the end. You know, like, it's a, it's kind of a... I think you end up here, I think, building a lot... My guess, this is the only guess, is you build so much more of, like, a grassroots thing or something. You know, like, you got to, like, work your ass off to be good in New York. And then you become possibly a darling for New York for better. You got to work your fucking ass off, be like yeah. great in Chicago for a bit or something. But I think it's a, a, maybe some, I, I mean, which could be easier or harder. I don't know. Get my 
what I find very interesting about you is that you, when you get to Paris, you're learning from, I guess, a jazz musician or your boyfriend how to sing these songs. That had to be hard. Well, in Paris, I was, I actually wasn't learning. I'd already, I'd already, I'd already like had my, my jazz boot camp sort of, um, with a really amazing piano player. But when I got to Paris, I think what was amazing was that everyone there kind of has this, because they, they, as a culture, they want to support art so much. You can end up meeting a bunch of people who are like miniature portrait painters or corset makers whatever and somehow I think that kind of inspires or at least at the time and inspired me in a way that I think would have felt a lot more daunting and in in especially in a city like New York but in wherever to be like a jazz like I wanted to be like a jazz singer and I felt like kind of like nervous about even saying that because it sounds I don't know it sounds uh, annoying really And, and and certainly presumptive and you don't really know how to start like how do you how do you start picking what your repertoire is that's actually good for you not just what you think it is and and whatever and I thought I think that it was amazing because Paris really afforded me because everyone was like I could have said anything I could have said I want to be a rodeo clown you know or whatever and and I, I think that I'd ended up in a group that would have really supported that and so it was a very gentle, nice place to like go through the baby steps of picking bad songs and messing up and being dead broke and doing the wrong I, thing. I was going to ask you about that because, you know, being broke in a foreign country, mm-hmm. it's like you can't call mommy or daddy when you want to. It had to be pretty tough. What were some of the things that you learned to adapt to into becoming a musician? I honestly... I think it was really a great time for me because I just, one, I constantly, I was alone a lot. And so I constantly would listen to music all day and night and try to like imagine myself doing this or singing this. So I'm practicing, even practicing more than I'm, than I'm doing now, which I should be practicing more. But then also I was going to so many more jams because I was so like the joy, if you're like broke, the joy of going to a jam and singing something and talking to people and probably even you know somebody who might even throw you you know like a free white wine every now and then or something after singing it makes you feel like you're in a community rather than just like broke at home wondering like I probably should have gone to college you know or something whatever and I don't know I think that it it was like invention by necessity you know of like of and now there's places there that I was going to for 10 years or something that you know that I I go back to now and or even some places that I've I sat at and like dreamt of playing even though I know this like is is going into cheesy land but I dreamt of playing some of these places and so to be able to play them later in life was my absolutely mind-blowing and so I think, I mean, being broke, I think, is a good necessity. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a, I've borrowed money off of my manager, I've borrowed money off of everybody I know, paid my debts, big on paying my debts. But, like, it's, I think it's a, it's, it's a way that you need to get creative and realize that either, like, either you have to kind of, you got to figure out something with, if it's got to be a jazz singer, you better start, like, singing for your supper or else, that, you know, I don't have many other skills. <laughs> That's how I was. Trophy I, wife, or yeah. <laughs> it's it. That's how I was when I first moved to New York ten years ago. It's like you enjoy the times where you ate the Seven Eleven hot dogs and drank the the big gulps. Yeah. Though you appreciate that. I yeah. Lo- you do. A hundred percent. I still appreciate that. Are you kidding me? There's no. <laughs> I'm still on Seven Eleven hot dogs. Oh, yeah, <laughs> but like I, just, yeah, you're. I think it makes you work. It makes you work harder a little bit. It's good. I think to be a little bit thirsty. What was the transition from Paris to, to the UK? Because, I mean, your musicianship had to go up a notch or two, and then I guess the people had to receive you a little differently. From, honestly, I, I, still, live, I still live mostly in Paris, but I, I, I 
my band is all English because I ended up signing with Sony UK and, and signed with a pop late with the pop um like section, which was cool. But I think I I mean, it was like date my band it was like dating. Like I just had to keep changing out some not not frequently, but changing out some people until it became the perfect mix of people who are like me, who listen to lots of other genres who are, like, informing themselves on those other elements all the time, who love what we're doing right now and who are willing to work hard and support kind of the band, to be, you know, kind of dorky about it, and also and are, and are can, like, be looking forward. Because, you know, sometimes, like, I think that this, the, there's a certain amount of, like, stagnation a little bit in jazz where it can get very, like very cerebral and very exclusive and certainly not in very inclusive at all you know and I've had you know I've I've been like I remember one time like I, I was singing I think I was singing at a jam because I, I I'm obsessively go to jams and I like didn't come back I didn't come back in on the right like drum solo like drum solo afterwards and I just didn't come back in on the right time and I was kind of panicking on stage this guy basically kicked me off stage I was like like they just like wrapped up the thing and he was like so rude to me and I went and cried in the bathroom and that is such like a jazz story you know of some guy was just like some singer who came up in here and probably you know I, I didn't know my key but you know whatever probably didn't know her key and didn't know when to come back in and thinks that she's hot shit when really she's the monkey on the back of this jazz jam um and yeah, I don't know. I mean, my band is now like my best friends. They're my best friends in the whole world. And I think it's a kind of, it's nice to find in jazz. It's nice to find people that can be your, your, your best friends who are really fun, who are really light and really like appreciative and really cool and not going in too much into the heavy and looking forward and kind of willing to, to think outside of the box. And I don't really know. I mean, the transition, I, I guess I didn't really answer the question. The, the transition was just was step by step by eking, eking step. I still mostly play in places that aren't the UK. I play like one or two big shows a year there, and then everywhere else is Europe. Um, so I don't know. I'm still learning about that. I'm still trying to, to figure out the balance. <laughs> Exactly, are you wanting your American fans to get from what you're doing musically and 
what are some of the steps that you are prepared to take to um, come back to come home? Come home, like my dad says. Keep my eye on the ball. Oh, what do I want? I want, I want to, I want to be jazz for people who don't like jazz, and I'd like to be also jazz for people who kind of who think that jazz should just be one, you know, one thing like this burning, you know, like me scatting over giant steps or whatever, knowing that like there's actually there's a there are other options and it's important to keep kind of pushing it. And I think that I'd love to, I'd love to experience the kind of like the amazing warmth and the, of like a tour here that I, that I've had sometimes in Europe, which I know is like, w would be easy and great. Everybody, you know, everyone's nice everywhere. I think you'll, people will find like, there's always some great, nice people around. Um, and I don't know, I'd love the challenge of playing some non jazz festivals here and see how that kind of went. And, and and I don't know, and mostly just making new friends like you. You know, I, um, I'm 46, so I grew up watching. Oh, you've been living in a cryogenic tank? You're looking good. Thank you, you're looking good too. I mean, <laughs> wow, we look good together, don't we? Look, we? we look good together, yeah, we, we look good yeah, together. We do, we do. I grew up on a thing called Schoolhouse Rock. Yeah, Bob Duro. Bob, I, was, I toured with Bob Duro as a Bobette. Oh, really? Yeah. Bob was such a sweetheart. He rest in may yes, he rest in peace. Yes. I sung, uh, you know, Figure Eight, the Blossom Dairy. I you. Why are we on the same page? Because <laughs> you know, Blossom Dairy, and this is crazy. Blossom and Grady Tate were. There's a lot of vocalists that did stuff with, with Schoolhouse Rock, but when I think of Blossom Dairy as a kid, I, I didn't realize that it was Blossom Dairy. We were listening to a lot of jazz watching those Schoolhouse Rock yeah. episodes. And Blossom Dairy, I think, is a vocalist that really never really got to do that she de deserved here. I was wondering how you get into Blossom Dairy. How did I get into Blossom Dairy? I'm not even sure what like what the initial catalyst of getting into Blossom Dairy was, but I know that when I started listening to singers, I was trying to pick some people that inspire you because not like you think you sound like them, but like they remind you of yourself somehow in a way that feels a bit like home or something. And I was listening. Do you know Chris Connor? I love, I was listening to a lot of, another like, you know, Lady Never Got Her Day. I have a lot of and I love her. I love Chris Connor. And I was listening, checking out like a, a lot of Chris Connor and a lot of Blossom Deary. And I thought like, gosh, I feel like this is who and where I am. It's like somewhere in between these two women. And... I think, and they, they're inspiring me. Because obviously, otherwise, like, for me, it's just Billie Holiday. But, and there's so many other singers, of course. But they're not ones, they're ones that I put on, but they're not ones that I feel like I emotionally connect to, like, that I'm, like, you know, reincarnated. Not even reincarnated. I don't know how to explain it. But just, like, I know what they were doing, and I get it. And I'm, and I'm so into it. And when I started listening to Blossom and also... People always for I mean, they know that she's playing piano on it, but I think sometimes if you, if you take away listening to some of, like, even, like, the weird 60s stuff that she did, take away listening to the baby voice and just, like, listen only to the piano, it's just mind-blowing. It's mind-blowingly good. I think she didn't get her day because she didn't want it, is my only guess. I think she, she could have so clearly pursued it, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm... <sighs> Shirley Horn, I believe, was like that, too. Yeah. You know, she she was very content playing piano bar in Washington D.C. and there's a there's a biblical saying: "Your best days are your last days." Hmm. She got her roses the last ten years of her life. That here's the life album kind of really took yeah, her to yeah. a very and and I think it was Michelle Legrand that really yeah that that was uh, that doesn't hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That doesn't hurt. I yeah. remember the first time I heard that record. I, I, I was there was a time where I was getting CDs and cassettes, and 
I popped the cassette in of Here's to Life. And I was just like, Jesus. Blossom and, 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 and Shirley were kind of in that. that Shirley yeah, is the they, shit. Yeah, yeah they, were, they were pretty much kind of in that, that, that vein. And I, I think the problem was, I think a lot of people expected more from them. But sometimes less is more. There's a woman, there's a, uh, she had basically only a couple of hits. Her name was Donna Hightower. And she basically left kind of at the height of her career in, in America because she had been on a date, I think, with like, um, she's black. And she'd been on like a date with a guy who was like some like white famous actor at the time. And they, the, or maybe not an actor, I think it was a singer. And then, yeah, that's what it was. She, she's from Austin, Texas, so I ended up hearing this, like, from the horse's mouth. And she said, basically, that they put in this, like, newspaper the, the, that the record label, whoever it was, huge like, record label was, like, you know, whoever it is, and friend, you know, and, like, a fan or something, a black fan or something weird that was, like, completely offensive and shitty. So she um, just packed up, left, and went to Italy and had these and had like a platinum record in Italy but she has almost no career in America and I found out through other people that this like amazing woman with these like crazy histories she's dated BB King like she's just cool was living in Austin and I so I asked her for voice lessons she's dead now unfortunately but because I was like chasing because so many of these people died like mid 90s they died just past when I could have seen them in and just watch them and worship them or whatever. And and anyway, so I would pay her for voice lessons, and basically they, they were just more like half voice lessons, half just like shooting the shit and like hearing these amazing life stories. And it reminded me just kind of like this like cool legacy of these women that had a choice. Like she did, she said she was like, I had a choice, but I just thought it was shit. I was just like... I was just sick of that shit, and I just thought I'd just go to Italy and do whatever. And so she's, you know, has a platinum record in Italy, and nobody's ever heard of her in America, and, you know, and she died in obscurity, but I think it was a choice. And she even, she said, I thought about going back to singing, and, but, you know, the Lord told me. I said, Lord, you know, where should I go? And he said, go to Austin, Texas. She said, I don't know anybody in Austin, Texas. And she said, and he said, well, you know me. So she just came to Austin. Like, it was just this kind of amazing you know, I don't know, this, uh, uh, an amazing disregard, I guess, for fame, you know, and, and, and the chasing of it. And I think that's kind of cool, too. Well, look at what happened to Betty, B Betty, uh, what was her name? Miles Davis's, uh, Betty Davis. Yeah. Betty Davis, she went religion on everybody. Yeah. And left and went back home, Pittsburgh. Yeah. And so Donna, I mean, I'm not like, I'm not saying that like I'm on that trail, but I'm with you. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> get in where you fit in, but <laughs> it's still, I think it's, I think there's a lot more, there's a lot more happiness probably in, in chasing whatever it is, you know, that, that was maybe not exactly the fame that that you think people should have. And you sometimes even love people a bit more when they're the underdogs. That'll do it again for another Ditch of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live from this year's 2019 New York City Winter Jazz Festival. I'd like to personally thank the incomparable and talented Miss Haley Tuck. Make sure you go out and support her debut record, Junk, which is now available on the Sony Records imprint. You can buy it now on Amazon.com as well as Google Play and Apple Music. I'd like to personally thank Mr. Bryce Rosenblum, the artistic director of the New York Winter Jazz Festival. Congratulations on 15 years of success. Also, I'd like to personally thank Mr. Matt Merowitz over at Fully Altered Media for handling all the public relations needs that I needed for this year's festival. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column, as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, It'll make you move. Till next time, peace. I
Darkness in my nose.